What's up and welcome to another episode of the SBL podcast, Scott and Ian show, except today you clicked on it, you know, you're going to get the builders forum from base space 2023, a very special treat. It was huge in 2023. 2022, and it was no different in 2023. You are going to get to hear from four of the top builders, luthiers, business owners, shop managers in base right now. Who do we have? We've got Carrie Nordstrand of Nordstrand Audio. We've got Joe Zahn of Zahn Guitars. We've got Will DeYoung, who is the shop manager at Spectre, formerly at Fodera. And we have Spencer Lull, who is from Mike Lull Basses and Guitars. You guys, it's so fun. Scott and I hang out. We ask questions. These guys talk. They're just incredible minds, and they know everything about the business and about building and about wood and pickups and hardware and construction techniques. There are people that ask questions. They answer all of those questions. We talk to Joe Zahn about Michael Manring's hyper bass. It's so much fun. So you're in for a real treat. I know I say that every time, but it, you know why? It's because it's true. It's because it's absolutely true. What do we got going on at SBL this week? Hey, we've got a mentor session coming up Monday, August 7th with the great Gary Willis, the language of music. Music is a language. Gary's going to talk to you about it. Gary's amazing. So be sure to check that out. We do live streams every single Monday on SBL as part of our mentors program. Gary's amazing. He's been doing it for a long time. I'm a huge fan. I just feel crazy that we even share that space together. It's amazing. Um, also you guys, it's the last week to lock in the 2023 base space recordings. When you grab a trial for the SBL membership, basically what we're doing right now is if you grab a free 30 day trial, that's double the trial length that we usually do of an annual membership. You save almost half of what you do if you sign up for the monthly. So if you sign up for the yearly, you save almost half, you get a month on us and you lock in all of the base space 2023 recordings. Now we're dripping one out for you right now. We're giving one out just a little taste a little taste of the builders forum. You like that? There's a lot more where that came from. Grab this promo because it will end very soon. Also community news. We've got the 2023 refresh challenge going on. So cool. Anita in our campus does these challenges with members where this one is about if you set some goals and maybe they've dropped off a little since the new year, this is the time to either set new goals or pick up those goals. And you're going to be motivated by all your colleagues and the people like-minded folks on the campus playing the bass as well. It's an amazing community. Come on out. If you're not part of SBL, now is your chance. The community's unbelievable. The most supportive, biggest, best base community in the world. I believe it. You know why? Because again, it's true. You guys, that's enough of me. Let's get to this interview, the Builders Forum from Base Space 2023. This is just going to be incredible. In fact, I think maybe here they come at the moment, but I, I will say this base, um, it's a wide five that Spectre made uh, for me, and it's absolutely incredible. Vintage pickup spacing has pre made in the US custom shop. This is a spalted top um, with flamed back and that black stained that black neck. Yeah, it's insane. Uh, it's just incredible. Um, and so it'll be fun. Ah, hey, hey, there he is. Hey, Will, how are you? Hey, hey Gary, good. Oh, hey, right. guys. oh, what's going on? Hey, Spencer. Spencer. Yo, yo, yo. What's up, dudes? Hey, how are you? Good to see everybody. We're just talking about bass. I was showing off this incredible, incredible Specter bass that will... I'm just going to move my camera. Give me one second. Yeah, yeah, do your thing. That I got to walk around the shop and pick out materials, and it was absolutely incredible. So, very fun. That's hot. <laughs> it's hot indeed scott was just playing a an old ken smith really cool instrument yeah no it's one of the it's one of the ones that vinnie federa made yeah it's one of the uh the early 80s i think oh, like wow. 80 84 maybe or 80, 82 or 84 early 80s let's go there but it's really it's really super cool like i like it because it's got the one piece top as well i really like the one piece tops in it as you'd expect <laughs> It sounds like a Smith. <laughs> that sounds great. 
And and do we also have Joe Zahn joining us? I believe we do. I am here just hey. uh, trying to get my camera on. Yeah, yeah. awesome. I'm a little, I'm a little new to this. Sorry, guys. Carib- are you in the Caribbean somewhere? <laughs> yes, I am. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, as, a, as a side gig, I'm carving surfboards. <laughs> Joe, I thought that that was a fake Zoom background. That's real. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. I, didn't, I didn't tell you guys about our second location for the shop, did I? That's bad. Oh, you guys must, you know, background, but I dig it. Nice. I got, I got to talk to my, uh, my uh, marketing department. This is, this is silly. <laughs> you guys doing? It's great to see you all. It's so good to see you all. I mean, this is going to be so much fun. I have had incredible interactions with all four of you, and some of you know that. And, and one or two of you may not remember because it's been a very, very, very long time ago. But I really uh, am so excited about this panel today of these four guys. We'll have you guys go around and introduce yourselves. But also I wanted to shout out to Eric Coco, who was supposed to be on from Labella and from Olinto Bases. But his poor kiddo has a massive ear infection. So oh, he's geez. in the ER. And I mean, you know... Any of us base dads know that when that stuff happens, of course, it takes priority over the base builders forum at base they don't base care. 23. Those kids don't give two shits. They're just like, yeah. <laughs> so our love goes out to Eric Coco. Sad he couldn't be Absolutely. here. Um, but we've got uh, these four guys, and it would be amazing if you guys could just go around, introduce yourselves, and, and maybe just tell us too briefly what made you want to get into making instruments oh yeah oh man who wants to kick it off yeah who wants to kick it off we'll, we'll let somebody jump in well Z's I'll are jump usually in. The or John, joe joe you you jump in sorry oh no i was, I was gonna say z is you always at the end of the alphabet so um <laughs> you know i uh started off uh, it's a really long story i'm going to try to make it as quick and uh, concise as possible um I started off playing bass and uh, I was always good with my hands and uh, decided one day I was just going to make a bass for myself. And uh, I was, you know, it was all hand carved. It was, uh, you know, chisel and uh, hammer kind of thing. And uh, I came up with an instrument that I was pretty happy with. And um, I was playing the local circuit, you know, East Coast band, all this kind of stuff playing, you know, along the coast and stuff. And, uh, you know, not much of a big deal, but anyway, um, I came across uh, a, a bass player um, hanging out one night. We were talking about gear, and uh, he asked me what I played, and I told him I had my own instrument, and uh, he didn't believe me. He said, bring it by tomorrow. I want to check it out. So I brought it to, to uh, the gig the next night, and uh, he was really impressed with it. He used it for the set and said, this thing is great, blah, blah, blah. And he said, would you have a look at uh, my, my Fender bass? I said, I've got problems with this thing. Nobody can do anything with it. And I said, sure. So I, I, you know, naively took the instrument from him. And uh, he just had kind of a wonky neck. And I had to do some fret work on it and stuff. And um, gave it back to him a couple of days later. And he said, man, he said, this is great. You know, I said, I've taken, taken this to everybody in the city. And nobody's been able to fix it. Uh, I took it to House of, Ro- House of Guitars in Rochester. They couldn't fix it, blah, blah, blah. I said, you're a natural. You should do this for a living. <laughs> like, no, I don't. I, I want to be. I want to play. I want to be a, you know, full time musician. And uh, you know, a week later, I got a phone call from somebody. Said, hey, you know, you fixed Rick's bass. Would you take a look at mine? I'm like, yeah, okay. And um, it just kind of snowballed from there, and then turned into a custom repair shop. And um, you know, I, I I got really successful at doing repairs and. I was based in Buffalo at the time and uh, as bands were coming through, you know, they needed some work done that they couldn't get done by their techs. So we did stuff for REM and Rick James and Genesis and God of whoever else. And, um, you know, basically I wanted to buy, I wanted to build, you know, the ultimate instrument, what I thought would be the ultimate instrument. And so I learned from the repair work really taught me a lot because it showed me what not to do and taught me what to do. And uh, so, you know, I used that experience to develop my own instruments. And, uh, you know, the big thing with working with 
some of these touring musicians where it was that, you know, their instruments were falling apart. And so it was important to me to build something that was really roadworthy, um, something that was consistent and uh, working with, uh, you know, composites, graphic composites and stuff, which I had some experience in college with. Um, that all kind of seemed to make sense for me. Amazing. There you go. And then you built the hyperbase, the end. <laughs> Damn uh, right. That's a different story. That's 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 a that's a crazy story. Yeah, that's that's well, a real interesting story. We'll come back to that. Uh, yeah. how, how about you, Spencer? How about you? Can you can you come back? Can you uh, tell us who you are and how you how you started? Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm Spencer Lull. Nice to see everybody. Um, nice to see you. Yeah. And so for me, it's a, it's a little different. So um, I was very uh, fortunate to be born into, uh, this wonderful community. Um, and it was always kind of just around in my, in my childhood. I was always at the shop I and mean, I've burnt my hand on every soldering iron in here. Um, I've, you know, <laughs> I got scars to prove it No, Um, but <laughs> I kind of was just always around. I was always very interested in it. And I started playing, uh, both bass and guitar at an early age. And, I was just, I nerded out on that stuff with my dad. I'd, I'd ask him why a bone nut sounds different than a plastic nut or, you know, what does the different fret material do for the sound? Um, and we just nerded out on that stuff. And uh, yeah, so I guess I've, I've always kind of had a passion for it. It kind of sparked early on because I would go to my, uh, to my dad's band rehearsals and he was always playing his instruments that, that he had made and occasionally like a vintage P bass or something. And uh, I just always compared sounds, compared instruments, um, asked him what his philosophy was on building and got to play a lot of different stuff because um, we still, my dad was, was like Joe was saying, very big in repair as well up in the Pacific Northwest and doing all the, the grunge scene uh, repair work and building instruments for, you know, Pearl Jam and Queensryche and Heart and I mean all all the guys up here in the Pacific Northwest. So I always got to uh, test out a bunch of stuff and see what I liked, what I what I didn't prefer, uh, and we still carry that tradition to this day of being what you know doing repair really really helps us see okay we're not going to do that that's not the right thing to do <laughs> and here's a really good thing to do and uh so yeah i mean that's that's kind of the short version of how i've uh you know gotten involved with this and i'm very very blessed to to be in this community i love every day that never feels honestly doesn't feel like work it's always exciting and we get to see something like wood turn into something that makes wonderful sound so it's it's awesome yeah. I love it. <laughs> How about you, Carrie? Well, I can, can you hear me? Okay. Just want to make sure. Yeah, ma. First yeah, time using right. it. Okay, good. Um, my, my, my journey kind of really got going when I saw a photo of Mike Tobias in the bass player magazine behind a pile of unfinished raw wood neck through beautiful Tobias instruments. And I just went, what i gotta do that <laughs> so so um that was he was a huge um it, my designs actually are, are, are you can see the the influence on on a lot of what i do aesthetically but but yeah he was a huge part of getting me started in and make making me decide that i'd really want to learn how to create a base for myself like so many of us that get started in this who i don't have a nice base and they're too way too expensive but maybe i can carve one out of this chunk of wood <laughs> um and uh yeah my first instrument was a uh, a fretless i don't know how many of us started making fretless because they're so much easier than fretted but um um it didn't have markers it had side dots it was it, um the guy i was learning from in the back of a shop here in redlands um this guy pete um, he kept telling me to carve the truss rod slot deeper and deeper on this thing. My first making the neck all from scratch myself. And then when I, I glued the fingerboard on, I left it really thick. And then when I carved the back of it, of course, I carved into the truss rod slot. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so I was like, man, I'm not listening to that guy anymore. Um, but, but, um, but yeah, I filled it with sawdust and I, I know a guy who still has that base. So, um, but yeah, that was kind of the beginning of it. Um, and then th this, um, the traveler guitar was a part of the beginning of my story, um, involved with that company. Um, and then working for Steve Azola and then uh, I started my own thing in 2003, 20 years ago. Um, and somehow I ended up here talking to you guys. This is pretty cool. Yeah. Happy twentieth, <laughs> Carrie. That's so cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. Very good. How about you, Will? Yeah. Um, my journey. Well, first of all, my name's Will DeYoung. I'm currently the Will. manager of the Spectre Custom Shop, just Ooh. outside of Woodstock. Um, and yeah, my journey started really as a as a player first. Um, you know, short disclaimer, don't hold this against me, but I am primarily a guitarist. Um, but I started on bass. I started on upright in school, playing in jazz band and orchestra and went to college for music and really just started like a lot of people, just tearing instruments apart, putting them back together, seeing what made them work, what I could change that affected my playing. And then I started working in a repair shop. Um, and that informed, obviously, a lot of what I do, as multiple people have said. Uh, but while I was working in the repair shop, I was very fortunate to spend basically all my free time with this great archtop guitar builder in Ohio named Denny Cop, who let me just come hang out at his shop anytime he's building and answer any and all questions that I had. And that really got me um, hooked on building for sure. And while I was doing that, my now wife, then girlfriend moved out to New York City. So I said, well, Guess I'm gonna look for something in the city and manage to get a job working at Federa for Vinny and Joey, and spent almost six years there. And now I'm upstate building at Spectre. Nice. Yes, Thanks. you are. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> oh man. Okay, um, you guys. We have. Uh, I know in the chat at Base Space, Lydia has informed everybody you can use that blue ask button to ask a question. Um, but I know, Scott, you've got some questions as well that you've prepared. And so maybe what we'll do is um, lean into some of those questions. And then, um, of course, we'll, ha we'll have some time to get to everyone else's questions at the end. And not everyone has to take them. If somebody feels like jumping in, this is, uh, everybody is so polite and nice at this, right? Uh, so, so feel free. If somebody really feels like taking a question, go for it. And um, I can't wait to see where this goes. So, Scott, you want to fire them off? Yeah, man, I've got a question. And I think that when I was coming up with it, I've got obviously the, you know, the people in the chat. Hey, guys in the chat, you guys will have a, uh, loads of questions as well. And as Ian said, when, when they come in, we'll, uh, we'll prioritize your questions above mine. But I had some selfish ones. So I will go first. And, um, and I'm always interested in uh, when it comes to people that make, uh, make instruments, they're kind of like philosophy around wood. Um, and and what they how they think about wood body wood neck wood fingerboard wood um carry smiling already um because i think it's it seems very different for different builders and i think from a a buyer's perspective it can be kind of intimidating if you're like oh yeah i'm gonna buy a base well what kind of body do you want? Like in terms of wood, what kind of neck wood do you want? What kind of finger, but like, fuck, where do you even start? So I thought it'd be cool to just go around the room and talk about sort of like, you know, broadly your philosophy of wood and how you, uh, how you think about the subject. Uh, should we, should we, do you want to go this same direction as we did last time? Joe, do you want to take it first? Sure. If you like, um, and the, Hey, and there might be sort of like re opposing, opposing, um, philosophies here as well. So sure. Yeah, you know, if absolutely. anybody wants to fight, go. <laughs> yeah, who's going to be the first to say that wood doesn't matter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we know who that that would be. Uh, no, not in this group. Um, you know, the interesting thing about tone woods, and I hope I can articulate this properly, is that um, as far as solid body guitars are concerned, you know, I mean, violins and orchestral instruments, it's always been, you know, maple and spruce and, you know, those traditional woods. Uh, but when it came to uh, electric guitars and basses, you know, Fender comes to mind first and foremost. And, um, you know, 
I have to, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that, you know, back in the early days of Fender, I don't, I really, I really don't think Leo was out in the lumberyard tapping uh, boards to hear what they sounded like. Uh, you know, they made guitars out of pine and all sorts of different stuff. And um, what's interesting is, you know, Leo just kind of went, well, what do you have that's plentiful and cheap? And it happened to be Ash and Alder. Um, how Swamp Ash got in that mix, I really don't know. Alder makes, you know, is, is makes sense. But what we've come to know uh, or accept as Tonewoods today were just, you know, run of the mill stuff that, um, you know, was available. It was, you know, cheap and, and, and plentiful. And so it's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, Alder and Ash and, you know, this kind of thing is, is, is now a Tonewood. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think that wood, and I've proven this to, uh, you know, myself and countless, you know, other musicians where we've sat down and listened to different woods acoustically. And um, it does matter. You know, when you've got um, a core of alder or ash or, you know, mahogany, um, it has one tone. And then when you put a top on it, it has another tone. And, you um, you know, we did this experiment one time, Michael Mannering and I, where we had a bunch of bases uh, that we were making for NAM, and they were all the same except for the tops. And uh, we, we lined them up next to each other and just basically played them acoustically. We just laid them down and just played the strings open. And you could immediately hear the difference between, you know, the walnut and the, the koa and, and the maple tops and stuff. So it does have an influence. Now, the top has got to be a certain thickness to have, you know, it's, at least has to be a quarter of an inch to have some sort of effect. The stuff where you're doing a veneer, well, that's that's decorative. But, uh, you know, and with our stuff, because um, it's kind of somewhat simplified in the sense where you're not mixing, you know, a rosewood board with a maple neck or a wengi neck and, you know, walnut stringers or any of that kind of stuff. With our necks being composite, it's pretty much a flat response. So whatever the body is doing, whatever vibrations you're getting off that wood, tonal characteristics of that wood, <clears throat> excuse me, is what really what you're hearing. So it takes one factor out of the equation for us. So it, in a way it simplifies it, um, but by the same token, you know, it, it, for us, it makes a superior instrument. Great, man. Yeah, I guess I'll go, uh... I'll go next. Go for Spencer. Uh, yeah, I would. I would say, uh, yeah, this is one of those questions that if you go on the forum rabbit hole, uh, everyone will be fighting <laughs> each other uh, intensely in the comments. Um, similar to Joe, I mean, we've definitely seen the difference in uh, different tone woods, and it is kind of funny that the history of tone woods started from just whatever you have whatever's cheapest and more plentiful because we need to make a lot of these things. And I mean, I would say when, it, when I approach talking about woods with a customer or with somebody who's looking at custom ordering a base, it really depends on that person and what they're looking for out of their sound. Mm -hmm. um, and really just asking the right questions of exactly what they're trying to achieve with their instrument. And but I mean, even with chambered woods versus solid woods, um, and I mean, there's there's everything you do to an instrument changes the tone. I believe, um, you know, they're they're highly resonant instruments. And yes, even though they're not, you know, big old acoustic, um, unamplified uh, instruments, and the pickups do make a massive, massive difference in the tone. Massive. <laughs> Um, most of the difference in the tone, uh, you do color areas of the tone with different woods and thicknesses involved and in whether it's solid or chambered and, you know, rosewood or maple, I mean, you can just go play the same bass back to back, whether it has a rosewood fretboard or a maple fretboard or an ebony fretboard, and you'll hear differences in all the instruments, um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm a big, big believer in nailing down uh, the wood choice. And it also keeps it fun and interesting, too. I feel like when people really poo-poo the idea of, of tone woods, this is going to be my hot take. Um, 
they're trying to justify why they don't need more than one instrument. They're, uh, they're sitting there going like, no, no, it doesn't make any difference. There's no difference <laughs> at all. And now I can curb my desire to want every nice bass out there. Sure. So, <laughs> anyways, just a hot take on that. But what's your yeah, favorite what combination, Spencer? What's your favorite combination that you guys have made? Oh man, it's so okay. I'm I'm a huge fan of roasted maple and of ebony as a combo, like for a neck. Um, I think it's really smooth. It's got a really nice top end to it. It feels really good tactile wise as well. And um, yeah, so ebony is probably my favorite fretboard wood personally. Um, and I've been loving the combo, the roasted maple and ebony. And I really like swamp ash myself, um, but it's different for different things. Like if I want a straightforward P sound, honestly, I'm almost always going alder rosewood for, my, for myself. It just, it works for that sound. Um, and if I want a little more brightness, maybe I'm putting an ash body with that instead of an alder body or, you know, going maple instead of rosewood on the fretboard. And, but yeah, to answer your question, my favorite for like a P sound, alder rosewood personally. Um, and for, I love ebony on a jazz. Uh, yeah, there's so many options. I, I couldn't pick one, but, uh, and that's part of the fun too. It's like it's the, hoping the final product sounds the way you want it to sound. And then you get to hear it once, once you make all those decisions and, and it's a lot of fun at the, at the end of the, you know, development too. Yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. K Kerry, you, you've had sort of like your bases of, cause I've been following what you've been doing for a long, like all the way back to, can you remember Scott Pizzera? Is it Pizzera? Like I yeah, can remember Pizzera. watching Scott playing your, like the first instruments around, you know, that design with the big cutaway and the, stuff like the that. The NX. Yeah. 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 The NX stuff, which was more sort of like, I guess sort of like fancy multi-laminate type of things. And then you went and then there was more kind of like jazz, more traditional mm -hmm. stuff, jazz P bass stuff that you were working on. And now you've got the, the basses behind you that I can't, <laughs> I can never, yeah. uh, I can never <laughs> pronounce it. But yeah, so has your has your wood philosophy changed over the years, or is it is it just because you've done so many different things over the years? Like, yeah, well, where are you at with it? Well, you so you uh, you might have caught me nodding aggressively when Spencer mentioned pickups. Um, but I so my you know the funny thing I was thinking about this as you guys were talking that, that, that I started with this issue of Bass Player Magazine that was about secrets of tone. Joe was in that issue in that oh, particular piece. I remember that Michael that wrote. Issue. Yeah. yeah. And it was all about the woods. I was so drawn to the woods, like what, all these exotic woods and you can put them together in all these recipes and find all these different tones. And then my career has basically gone away from that. My, my, my explorational journey of tone and woods has led me to pickups. Um, I've, I've done, I mean, yeah, but <laughs> I'll get to like naming the order of, of things that I think are most important in an instrument. But, but for me, wood, I've moved towards less blue lines, simpler, more complete pieces of wood in my instruments. Currently I build, I'm doing a small batch of P's and J's for my 20 year thing. And um, they're going to have solid Okume bodies. And Okume is this kind of a mahogany like, uh, wood mm -hmm. that I found out from Roger Sadowski about. He was using it as a mahogany substitute. And to me, it kind of presents halfway between alder and, and rosewood. And it's always, you can get it nice and light and these really big one piece chunks. And, and whenever I make a base with one piece body, it has character for days. So I think to me, I like to think about uh, simpler, less blue in an instrument as having more character of the wood. And I'm always searching for the ideal weight. I think weight is probably the most important factor, weight and density in wood selection, especially because at the end, you want the instrument to be a, a good weight. And for me, the best sounding instruments are always in this sweet spot between say, oh, seven and three quarters to maybe nine pounds for a four string P and a little heavier for a J because J's tend, tend to weigh more for the same kind of wood. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, um, so, so 
I've been approaching things and simpler and simpler, even to one piece net, like a, like a one piece net with a skunk stripe in it. Maple is one of my favorite. I love maple. And, and a lot of people think about maple as a hard, bright, aggressive sounding wood. But when you pull the way you find the material, that's not super heavy and super dense. It's actually very comparable to alder in, in, in a lot of ways to my ears. So, mm. and, but it's punchier. It has this tactility to it. That's just fantastic. So I, I've always had a, a soft spot for all maple instruments, as much maple as I could get in an instrument. Um, curly maple, solid body. I like to make solid figured wood instruments because when you get around the sides, they're just, they blow your mind. But um, so, so yeah, for me, it's it's about the weight. Um, I've gotten into using quarter saw maple necks. I was not really a believer in that for a long time, but, but that's, seems to work really well. Um, I have some leftover Brazilian I'm using up. Uh, but other than that, I like Wenge for fingerboards. Um, mm -hmm. uh, other dark, you know, uh, rosewood. It, I'm less picky. I mean, yeah, I, there's nothing like a nice Brazilian rosewood board. I mean, let's just be honest. That that stuff is. But but we listen. I'm using the rest of what I have, and I'm done with it. And I'm moving down the road looking for more interesting things. I, I've gotten into making using uh, woods from the family property in Minnesota. Um, I have some balsam poplar that I'm making an NJ for, uh, for myself. So that's going to be, a uh, this is funny because, uh, Spencer mentioned roasted woods. I'm not a huge fan of roasted woods. They haven't really proven themselves to me yet, but I'm actually using a roasted curly maple in this instrument that I'm making for myself. So I'm taking a big leap here. <laughs> Hopefully it works out. Um, it, it's got a pow ferro fingerboard. Um, but yeah, um, I'm kind of a diehard older rosewood guy, you know, foundationally tonally that's that's where i like to live but for me scale length pickup placement strings uh bridge material wood wood comes in not very high in the list in terms of tone as far as the weight's good and the structural capabilities of it meet meet the situation um uh there's so many other things that are drastically more important than wood yeah so, like for, yeah. for me do, can you speak to that a little bit maybe we'll just need, we'll need to go around again but you know like as a customer when they're they're looking at a pie chart right the pie chart is divided up into these things that that will help shape the tone what percentage it'd be great to go around the room and just get a get a sort of like a read on this because this could be wildly different what percentage of the pie chart does wood um equate to on that pie chart Corey, Corey um, uh, Kerry, do you want to, yeah, do you want to take it? Yeah, for me, man, it's less than 50% for sure. It's probably somewhere in the 30 to 40% range, um, possibly even less than that, depending on what, what kind of instrument you're talking about. I mean, obviously, if you're talking about, you know, a neck through Federa, you know, the woods are going to be pretty important um, because there's there's so many factors going into how this thing, thing ends up, you know, in the, the recipe. I mean, that's that's the appeal is, is that you could push things in a different direction. Um, but I went through a lot of custom orders back in the day of like guys talking, what if we use an ebony layer in here and we do this and that and then maybe this for the, and, and, and it was just after a while, it was just like, you know, at the end I'd listen to it and I'd be like, I, well, I don't, I don't know. Why are we doing all this? Um, hmm. I don't, I'm not particularly fond of the way these instruments sound. Um, and, and that's just my taste. Um, they're certainly valid in, in the world of musical instruments. I, I don't want to criticize them that way, but, but um, yeah. Um, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I would love to on, hear Will's that. take on this too, because when I was at uh, Spectre, Will, um, you know, when we were specking out this bass, I got to play some really similar instruments because, you know, you guys had made a bunch of U.S. custom shop instruments. And I was like, oh, you know, is ebony really that much different than other fingerboards? And you, I got to play back to back a couple of bases, one with ebony and one with, I, I don't know, maybe Palfero or something else, maybe maple. Um, and there was, you, you spoke to this like point of note that obviously the electronics and the pickups could really capture as well. I mean, you know, you have to have really sort of wide sounding uh, pickups, electronics to be able to capture some of those nuances. But I heard it so clearly. Um, and I would love if you could speak to this too, of how you feel wood contributes to the overall sound of the instrument. Yeah, of course. Um, 
first and foremost, I just have to say it's nice to be among a group of people that I wholly agree with on this subject. <laughs> um, obviously, we all know wood makes a difference. Uh, you know, to what Carrie was just saying, I I would love to think wood makes more of a difference. I want it to make more of a difference, but I agree it probably makes a lot less of a difference than than I really want it to. Um, you know, I like to think of what we do, or at least what I do is more woodworking first. That's like kind of my favorite part of it, even though being a musician and, you know, getting to play, that's the end goal. I really love the woodworking aspect of it. So I, I try, you know, I want there to be more value in it, but there are times when I, I think, you know, it could be as low as 10%, honestly, mm. um, depending on the combination. Uh, a couple other points. Yeah. I do also agree with Carrie's point that I like less glue joints. I think the more solid piece of wood, the, the fewer pieces of wood that are glued together, the fewer seams, the fewer, not that wood is unnatural, but you know, the more natural surfaces there are, the better. Um, but really, I think the best way I've come to describe and explain the difference that wood makes, especially to the people that think wood doesn't make a difference because i'm sure we all saw that video the guy made of you know telecaster playing a telecaster in all these different scenarios you know he had removed the neck and put a slab of wood on there hit bolt the bridge and the tuners to a steel beam and say see it all sounds the same my problem is what you're judging is twofold one is a sustained sound versus listening to the attack but also the feel Obviously, we know the feel is a huge part of that, and wood choice plays a lot into the feel of it, not just physically how it feels when you touch it, but also how it resonates and what you want to get out of the instrument when you're playing it. But I think the biggest point really is that attack, the beginning of the note, is where the wood makes the most difference. Um, and while it is still greatly outweighed by pickups and electronics, I like to think of the wood as being a passive EQ for the front of the note. It, it can't add anything, but the way an instrument physically works, an electric instrument anyway, the string is vibrating. The pickups pick up that frequency. Whatever the string is doing, that's what the pickups translate out to the amp or to the interface or whatever. And the string can only vibrate in a way that whatever it's attached to allows it to do. So a lot of people say ash is great for slapping because it has a lot of highs and a lot of lows. Well, it doesn't have any highs or lows. It doesn't bring that to the table it just takes away some mids um ebony you know like you were talking about ebony doesn't make an instrument brighter it just allows the high frequencies of that string to carry through into the pickups so yeah ultimately i think wood makes a huge difference but especially as a passive eq to the front of the note for sure hmm. does that mean sorry <laughs> What I'm thinking, like I play quite hard, um, so therefore, because I play harder, then let's say Ian, for instance, Ian has got a, what I would say, a delicate touch. Ian. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ian, <laughs> Ian plays a lot softer, um, and there's other other bass players that play soft as well, like Gary Willis, for instance. He's talked about it a lot, where he'll play a note, and his philosophy is that he'll reduce the um, he'll reduce his, I guess, his stroke down or the, the attack of his stroke because he wants the note not to have a huge front end and then die off. He wants it just to be more sustained as it goes along. Whereas I'm the opposite and I dig in real bad. Um, so I guess, I guess I haven't got a question. There's a question in there somewhere. But when you said that, that the body would actually affects the front end of the note, more than the rest of the note that was just interesting to me because i think that you might hear the front end of the note different for different players depending on how much they dig in or don't dig in maybe yeah i think that's fair however think about when we play an instrument you know you don't just strum all the strings open and let it sustain for forever that's not how you play you know you're constantly yeah. attacking and while the strings and your hands and where you place them and all that stuff is probably making more of a difference you can get more compression or more, you know, immediacy of attack. I, really, mostly all of the things related to compression happen right at the front of the note. 
Um, and that's what you're getting through a lot of the wood, in my opinion. Yeah, super interesting. Mm-hmm. Hey, um, I think there's a lot to be said about this uh, action and, uh, you know, right hand attack and how hard we play and how um, comp- when you start getting into recording, when you start playing a lot of, you know, tracks and conventional music, um, the way the note compresses, how long it sustains, all that stuff becomes a really important part of how the music moves. Right. So, so, so a higher action bass with a more aggressive right hand is going to have more character on the attack. It's going to sit in the track very differently than something that's played very consistently and evenly and pre compressed off your fingers. And so, if you want movement, depth, tone, all kinds of character in your sound, I think a higher action setup with a more traditional uh, instrument is, is going to deliver better results than a low action. You're going to have a hard time getting a, a, a big booty out of that, in my opinion. So, um, you know, it's not going to work as well in, in a lot of musical situations where bass has a very traditional role, in my opinion. So, We've yeah. got a bunch of audience questions, actually, and I think we should, I think we should dive in. Is that can cool? You do it. If I, yeah, can, if I, I can jump I in here real chat, quick. So. Yeah, oh, go for you, Joe. If I can jump in here real quick. Um, so in my opinion, um, when you're building an instrument, you're not building an instrument around pickups or hardware specifically, you're building an instrument around acoustics because I feel that an electric instrument is an acoustic instrument. If it doesn't, and I've, I've found that if it doesn't sound good acoustically, it doesn't, it, it doesn't sound good electronically either. So you've got to you've got to work from a foundation, and, and to me, what is the foundation? Um, that's where you get your acoustic tonality from. Pickups, uh, strings, hardware, finish are all very very important in that recipe to achieve the tone of an instrument that your customer wants. Um, now, with our stuff. It's different because I'm. I, we don't do wood necks. I mean, we have, um, but our main stock and trade is composite necks. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where players will pick up my instrument and go, "Oh, it responds differently," and because of the rigidity and the stiffness of the neck, the attack of the note is much more instant. It doesn't when you pluck the string. It doesn't sound and then swell. It's immediate. So some people may perceive that as being uh, bright, which it isn't, but uh, they're just not used to that response being so instantaneous. And with our instruments, because of the the neck structure, uh, which is hugely influential on the sound of our instruments, um, you will find that you can be more expressive with it. So if you're a light player, and you want to dig in, you can get, as Kerry said, more booty out of it. But if you want to back it off, um, you know, it's just like a sports car. You can just cruise along and you know, you're fine and you punch it, and you're, you're, you're gone. So um, you've got more flexibility in right hand technique as far as being it's more expressive with the instrument and, and, and as far as what we're building. That's great. Cheers, Joe. That's great. Oh. Uh, We've talked about just why you have you got a question? I know you've got a bunch of questions, Ian. I, I've got them all here, and uh, we're sorting by popularity. So if everybody who's watching takes a look at that ask button, um, upvote the questions that you want to answer because obviously we won't have time. We have a bunch of questions, you guys. We've got a lot of questions. Yeah, we do. We have a lot, and there there won't be time to get to them all. So make sure you upvote the ones that you want to hear these guys talk about because um, these guys are the guys. Um, so yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to dive into that if you don't mind, Scott. Yeah, go for it. I, I've got one question, but I'll save it till, uh, I'll save it till later. <laughs> we'll see if we've got time. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to okay, deprioritize go. mine, <laughs> but if you, go. if you've got the questions, Ian, you read the, I, I haven't got the chat, so I'm going to yeah, I'll leave on you for that. No you? sweat. Here we go. Um, I've got them on my phone. So if I'm looking at my phone, please don't think I'm doing something else from Julie M would love to hear the guests discuss the rise of multi-scale bases. This is the most upvoted question by the way, wow. and what considerations they make for a multi-scale base versus parallel fret construction base. Anybody want to jump on that? Multi-scale is in fan fret. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't mind <laughs> starting off. I have, I have, <laughs> I don't have deep thoughts on it. Um, my thoughts on the multi-scale thing, I really look at it more as, um, evening out the tension of the strings yeah. across the instrument more so than just having a longer scale length on the low end, which I know is what most people use that for. You know, that's the big advantage to a lot of players that either drop tune or, well, mostly drop tune. Yeah, is that you want that extra scale length on the low end. But I really like the aspect of it that you have more even tension across the instrument. Yeah. Um, I remember for a number of years I played uh, in a trio where I played a Novak eight string kind of like Charlie Hunter. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that I can love them. Yeah. It was so much fun. And I love doing that, but um, it was not nearly as hard to grasp the feel of that instrument as I thought it would be. It, it feels much more natural than I thought, but also I know, you know, Ralph thought, thought that out a lot and put a lot of care into that. I know. Sure. Um, but I, my short answer is that I really like the, um, even tension aspect of it a lot. Um, and that's, that's where I would focus on if I were, and maybe we are designing a multi-scale, um, more so on the even tension side of things than just going for extra string length for lower tunings. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else care to, to jump in on that one or should we move along? I can add a couple of words to the multi-scale thing. I yeah. don't make them and never have, uh, but we've developed pickups for them, specifically the Strandberg instruments. Oh, um, yeah. And um, I'm, and Ibanez, obviously Ibanez. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> um, so, so um, yeah, it's, it's, they're not my taste. I mean, my taste is, is, is in this short scale, fat, round, thick, dubby, synthy type things. And I don't, typically get that off of multi-scale instruments. Um, they definitely move towards the piano end of things for me. Yeah. Um, but but I'm, I'm really tight with uh, Sheldon Dingwall. I consider him a very good friend. And uh, I think, you know, he's been at the forefront of, of putting Ralph's work in the world, you know, in a big way. And uh, there's it's very popular now for a really good reason. Um, but but I, I'm, I won't say that I understand it very deeply other than I, I really get the piano thing and the big, broad, wide sound. And especially for the, the some of the heavier music that's out there, it, the, the note is cleaner. There's less stuff on it. So it works yeah. better with dirt and, and a lot of other things. So, so it makes a lot of sense functionally. So, but it's just, it's not my thing. I will say, um, when I said it was the most upvoted, I feel like I maybe hadn't refreshed in a while. There's, there's a few others that might be higher just so that you don't all panic and go, Oh my God, do we all start to need, you know, do we all need to be building? <laughs> it, it, it wasn't the most popular question. Um, now the most popular, you know, question. You know I understand, uh, the concept that Ralph had, uh, you know, using the, uh, multi-scale length for the string tension. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I haven't found a need to go in that direction because, um, you know, our stuff has the clarity and the definition right out of the gate, which doesn't really necessitate uh, a different scale length to make the instrument project or, or uh, you know, articulate in, in the voicing um, that what might be necessary with uh, you know, multi, you know, multi-scale instrument. I mean, um, we've, we've got, we've got a lot of prog metal guys on our roster. And one of the things they like about our instruments is that they can detune and, um, you know, it still has cut and mix. It'll still cut through against the drums and the detune guitars and everything else. Um, you know, the, the one thing, the, the one thing that is a difference that I will admit is that when you, you know, detune a, a straight 34 inch scale bass, you don't have the same string tension as you would with a multi scale. I mean, that's obvious. So that's where the multi scale uh, wins out. But, um, you know, as far as our stuff is concerned, um, our the players that we have find that uh, they don't need a multi scale to get that kind of definition and, and, and cut in the mix. And I would, yeah, I would also, um, I just want to add that, that I concur also with what. Carrie was saying like um, total massive respect for, for Sheldon and for Ralph. Yeah. And I mean, making that a thing, 
it really depends on what someone's going for tonally. I, it's not totally my thing, but again, it's, that doesn't mean that it can't be anybody else's thing. Um, we don't make them. We, we probably won't. Uh, it just does something different than, than we're going for with what, with our instruments. So yeah. For sure. Okay, guys, how about this one? We've um, we've sort of addressed this, but this is now the, currently the most upvoted question from Elliot. Um, so the first part we've addressed, but the second part I think is really interesting. He's asking, what are the biggest factors that determine the sound of a bass? So if you want to sum that up and speak to that again, you sure could. But also, what would you invest in first if you were trying to save money and still get a great tone? Ooh. Um, can I speak to that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, yeah, so this this could be a loaded loaded question because it depends on a lot of different factors. Of what of, you know, what's a lot of money? To somebody, what are they trying to save? What are their are they trying to gig? Are they trying to be in the studio more? So there's there's a lot of different ways this could go. Um, I mean, I think investing in a really nice set of pickups for your instrument if you have a you know uh you know if you have an inexpensive or entry-level instrument and you can't afford uh and there's nothing wrong with that if you can't afford you know something that's in the higher price spectrum get yourself some upgraded electronics i mean get yourself better pickups maybe shield your instrument um especially if you're gigging or if you're you know needing to use it for the studio and it's not just you know recreational and having fun in your uh you know in your house or, or what, or whatnot. Um, but upgrading the electronics would definitely be the first place I would go personally. If I was looking to upgrade my instrument without spending a ton of money. Um, and the next thing I would say is that can then lead into the debate of, well, the pickups are all, that's all the sound is in the pickups, which then goes right back to the same kind of idea of, well, does tone would make a difference. Right. And I would just sum it all up by saying kind of what everybody has already mentioned here, but every single thing you do to an instrument changes that instrument. And first and foremost, the first person in the signal chain or the first thing in the signal chain is how you're playing it. So right. if you, uh, you know, if you haven't had a chance to, find your own voice and what you like to play and you haven't tried a lot of stuff, you might not know how to have each one of those factors affect your sound. Um, you know, having brass hardware versus aluminum hardware makes, makes a difference in the tone. Uh, pickup placement, huge difference in the tone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, construction style, very big difference in the tone. Um, and I would just say, you know, without even necessarily pitching what we make or what anybody else makes, I would first and foremost, if you're looking to cheaply or inexpensively upgrade your instrument, electronics, number one, that's the first thing. If you have a bass that you like and it's, it's, you know, you like it and you want to put some, something into it to make it better, upgrade your electronics. I think we know a guy maybe on this panel that could help you out with that. And um, the other thing is then once you're into that realm of, Hey, I want to try and venture out into other, you know, maybe higher quality instruments, um, you know, more time, the, the, the more expensive an instrument gets, it's generally because more handwork or more time goes into that instrument. Um, there's more care and, uh, artistry that goes into it and that's going to affect the tone. Sorry to say, it's just going to affect the instrument, especially how you not to go on a whole rant here, but if you like that instrument, if you play that instrument and it does something for you as a player, and that's the most important thing that you play it and it does something for you so that you can connect with it better. You can communicate with your instrument better and therefore get better sounds and better tone and, and all that stuff. If it doesn't necessarily matter what, what, uh, you know, keeping up with the Jones is if you have to have the most expensive instrument to like, tell your friends that you have, uh, you know, the superior instrument. I've seen people play unbelievably well, sound incredible on very inexpensive instruments. And I've seen, uh, and on very expensive instruments too. And I've heard 
people not sound good on very, very expensive instruments. So it's, yeah, you know, course. there's a yeah. lot to that. To un I know I just, you know, kind of unloaded a bunch onto that topic, <laughs> but hopefully that helps can somebody I, out there. So. Can I jump on that a little bit? Um, I, I would say, I mean, obviously the low hanging fruit for me is to suggest to change your pickups and preamp out doughy. That's obvious. Uh, but cause that's what we do. And we've done tons of that over my career and to, apparently a lot of people like uh, tone the way I like tone because it's gone pretty well so far uh, but I think one of the things that maybe we don't talk about a lot that that might deserve a little little more interest um, is an attention is your relationship to the setup and how the setup impacts the tone and your hands and yeah. all of these things are huge so so Play as many bases as you can with your friends. You get into a circle where you can try things. I mean, go into a store. Try. The problem with stores is, is most of the time, you know, you're really taking a shot on whether or not something's going to be set up and playable, um, unless you know a really good store. So you're going to be better off playing friends' yeah, instruments, yeah. meet more players, play their instruments, check out their setup, check out their tone. Just really find your own path to your sound and be careful about following all the sheep down the, the new trails. I mean, sometimes that's good for us because we really something new and it's hot and everybody wants it. But, but at the same time, you know, your tone is, your, is a personal journey. Um, it really is. And, and, you know, we get questions all the time. How can I sound like Marcus? How can I sound like Jocko? And I'm like, okay, let's use that as a starting point. But who are you musically? What is your tone? And, and your relationship to the instrument from everything, from the nut height, the fret size, the neck thickness, all of this stuff impacts how you deliver that string into sound. And, and um, you want to have a deep relationship with it and you want to have as much exploring um, how different people that you respect in your community use their instruments, how the instruments feel, what they're all about. Um, I think that's a, a really good way to, to, to find your own sound. And I deeply encourage that. Yeah, I think what Carrie said sums up a lot of what I was going to say. I think the the best place, first and cheapest place to spend your money is on a tech. Is a good tech, get a good setup, get any issues you have addressed with the instrument so that you feel inspired to play and find your own voice and then figure out what you like and you can go from there. Not yeah. to not to jump in for Eric Coco, who isn't here, but I bet if he were here, he would also <laughs> say strings. And that's something that I say a lot as well. Um, where when people ask me, I've got a bunch of bass guitars, and you know, people say, ah, oh, if I can't afford to have a bunch of things, what's something inexpensive that I can buy? Um, and a set of strings, boy, oh boy. I mean, if you think about it, and I know, you know, probably it's been alluded to, right? These guys are alluding to it, but the thing that you interface with, that your hands interface with first are the strings. Right. They're huge. Strings are huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big deal. Yep. yeah. Flats and rounds and tapes and all the things. And they're relatively inexpensive compared to a new instrument, a, a, a completely, you know, new set of pickups and electronics or even a, a complete setup. Right. So it's something too to keep in mind. Strings are a big deal. Yeah. I think strings go hand in hand with the setup. I mean, when you when you go in and you get a setup and you you go, especially if you're changing, <laughs> if you're right. just putting new strings on, it's not not that big a deal. But if you're going from from like a light tension round to a, a, a flat wound or something, you're gonna have to tighten the truss rod. So right. so it's all connected. You might need to open the nut slot up so the string sits in there and it's not pinching and you're having tuning issues. Uh, saddles, you might need to adjust the saddle height because the string flats move more than rounds do. Um, they have more inertia. They want they need to sustain longer. So there's a lot of factors, and, and strings are are kind of intimately connected to setup. Yeah. Well, you you know the thing is that I I think the best advice I would give someone is to find a good tech, find somebody in your town that is really knowledgeable, someone who does you know repair, and someone hopefully that you know is familiar you know, very familiar with bass, isn't just sort of a guitar guy who, you know, happens to, to repair basses. Um, and, you know, sit down and have a, a mind meld with this person and say, hey, you know, this is what I'm looking for. What do you think? How are my pickups? How are my electronics? What are the, what are the strings like? Uh, what are the frets like? Um, I know I'm really good friends with uh, Jeff Luttrell over at SF Guitar Works. And um, 
you know, 90% of the guitars that come through there straight out of the factory need a plec. Uh, the fretwork yeah. just is, is, is subpar. Yeah. And uh, these guys, they bring their guitars in their basses and uh, they walk out after the plec job and it's like a new instrument. It's like, this is incredible. I've, it's never played like this before. So Huge difference. some of the high end stuff. Um, so I, I would really suggest, you know, going to see and, and consult a, a really good tech get their advice and their suggestions on what you can do, where the weak points are for your instrument, where you can improve, and then and then take it from there. Excellent. I've got another one for you guys. Um, the second most upvoted question at the moment is from Butter Jesus, who asks any advice for anyone who wants to build their own base in terms of resources and education to get started. What if you want to get into this crazy game, guys? <laughs> so, so is this question about building an instrument for yourself or actually getting into the base building business well that's a great question and i think it would actually provide a lot of value to you go ahead and decide that for yourself joe like do you have feelings about that either way um <laughs> i mean you know i think I, I think either either way to answer yeah. that would be cool yeah um mary mary well that's what I, that's the first thing you want to do is, uh, marry well. Mike uh, Tobias, you, Mike Tobias sure you, told me. You, you marry oh, into a family that has deep pockets. Well, that's, <laughs> Mike, Mike Tobias told me the best way to make a million dollars making guitars is to start with 2 million. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. pretty much akin to a winery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like he said that yeah. actually last year. <laughs> Builder forum. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm sure he's used it before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. Yeah, what's the funny is what, what's funny is people look at the price of our of our instruments collectively. Okay, I'll speak for everybody here, um, and they think that we're all you know onto our second Ferrari and our uh, you know seaside mansion, and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, I I would venture to say that we're all here because we're doing this because we love the art, we love the craft. We love the camaraderie. We love bass. Um, you know, it's kind of, well, for me, it's the life that chose me. You know, it's uh, kind of about it. But, um, you know, if you're going to build a bass for yourself, that's, there's so much out there. Um, you know, Warmoth has got you just a multitude of, of options and things like that. Um, where you could construct something, I would I would build I would go to somebody like Warmoth and, and get all the parts from them because you know that everything's being made uniformly and stuff is going to fit together. Um, if you're going to go that route, don't Joe. Out, if, don't if somebody hasn't heard of Warmoth, can you tell them what Warmoth is? Warmoth is um, is a is a parts company. Um, they build well. They build guitars. They build basses, but uh, they they are really big in uh, supplying necks and bodies for you know diy people the uh, people that want to build something custom for themselves or you know they want something unusual and it's really good quality stuff i mean it really is it really is well made it's all made here in the states uh in washington i think it is right yeah they're up here they're up yeah, here yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. i would say um just to, to piggyback on that too if you're interested in starting something like building something for yourself um building something from scratch for the first time is an entirely different thing so if you're looking at your first instrument to make for yourself totally totally would recommend go to warmoth um even in our repair shop uh that's what i'll tell people who want to make their own um, but also don't be massively disappointed if it's not the greatest instrument in the world that you build as your first instrument um because it's not going to be like it just it just won't be so if you <laughs> if you're like yeah, that's going to be the best thing ever. I mean, I remember doing the first refret with my dad and he just kind of looked at it and was like, that kind of sucked. Like you, that you didn't do that good on that. I'm like, well, help me, man. Um, <laughs> so but that, well, that was okay. Cause it was Jeff immense base. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah for sure. For sure. Um, definitely not. No. Uh, so I would say, um, yeah, if you're looking at making something for yourself, definitely go the parts space route there's warmoth is really really great really reputable and not super expensive um you can pick out your pickups you, or, you know you buy pickups from another manufacturer make sure they fit in the routes that you buy from 
from Warmeth. That's very important. Uh, make sure that you you do your research on what types of hardware and scale length and all that stuff so that you're going into it educated. Um, we have a lot of people come to our, I'm not trying to plug my repair shop, but a lot of people come to our shop with a bag of parts and with Warmeth parts and go, make it like one of yours. Mm. And it's kind yeah. of funny because I go, that's not possible with this because it's not <laughs> going to be the same thing. But I get what the concept is. The concept is make it into a really great instrument. We'll shield it. We'll make sure it's it's set up properly. We'll we'll pleck them, you know, on our on our pleck. We'll do a lot of different stuff to make it as killer as it can be. Um, but that's also someone that's looking at making something great for, you know, n- not as much money as going the boutique base route. And it's not going to be a boutique base. Like it's just is the way it is. Um, as yeah. far as the business aspect of things. Um, you know, I concur, uh, and now I can, I can kind of speak to this in a little bit of a, uh, firsthand experience of going through, not to bring up a downer subject or whatnot, but going through the transition from, uh, when my dad passed away in 2020 and then having to carry the business forward. And the base business is not only a really awesome business, but it's, it is a, it's quite a difficult business to actually make it in. If you're just looking at simply uh, selling bases, if that's the sole source of revenue for your, ins- for your company, um, you have to think about it like purely just with, yeah, I mean, third grade math. If you make an instrument, you want to say something? I was going to say that, that's why I started making pickups. I mean, yeah, <laughs> right. I couldn't so, just make well, bases. It wasn't enough. It, it, oh yeah, yeah that's, survival. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's you know, I'm, I yeah. might want to. I, I might add here that if you were interested in learning to build an instrument for yourself, um, forget about being in the business, but just say you want to do it as a hobby or something, I would totally suggest signing on to one of the classes, mm-hmm. like at uh, attending Roberto Venn. Um, you've got experienced. Uh, builders there that will teach you the basics, the fundamentals of building an instrument. And a lot of times those guys, when you, when you sign on for one of those courses and they're, they're not necessarily inexpensive, but um, if you, you know, find this is something that you like and you want to sort of pursue on some sort of a small scale um, you go to Roberto Vent and that's going to save you a lot of, you know, hair pulling and teach you the fundamentals and the basics uh, so that, you know, you can build a quality instrument and generally speaking, when you sign on for those classes, you actually build an instrument or two that you're going to take back with you. So it's not like you're just paying somebody to, to you know, show you a bunch of stuff and then you're on your own. You actually build the instrument, you know, while you're attending the course. How long um, is the course, Joe? Do you know? I don't know. I'm, it's, I, I'm it's about really six months. About six. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right now. I mean, that's that's where we hire out of. So it's it's a. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that is very important. If you're looking, if you're actually like committed to wanting to get into the trade, and you want to become a luthier, um, whether that's in repair or in you know, manufacturing instruments, um, that is the place that most manufacturers will go and look for mm. talent. Because not right. only does it show from a business perspective that the person is committed to actually wanting to be a good craftsman, which is very, very important. Um, But also you, you leave with at least a fundamental basic knowledge of uh, how things work in an instrument. Uh, um, Can can I go against the grain a little bit real quick? (laughs) Um, I think, uh, well, cause, cause when I started in the nineties, the internet was just a new thing. And, And I used to sit there and scour websites and look for photos of people's wood shops because there wasn't YouTube showing you how to do everything, right? I mean, obviously, if you're going to dive into the YouTube pool, you've got to wade through a lot of stuff to really get to the nuggets that have value. That's why the you know services like SBL are worth so much, because they really focus the, 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 the content down to make it really valuable. But you can dive into the world of CAD design, buy a CNC machine, and make a base at your house if you want to. These days, that is possible, okay? You can 3D print a bunch of stuff, there's so much you can do now that we couldn't even dream of back in the day when I got started. Um, CNCs were $80,000, $100,000 machines. There was no way you could put one in your shop. 
So, so you can actually, without going to any schools, you can sit in your garage and look at YouTube and figure out how to make stuff. You don't need somebody helping you. Now, are you going to be any good at it? That's a whole other question, right? That comes down to who you are as a person, what your character is, what you want to see in the final result, how much patience and attention you can put into things. Um, these are all factors that's going to inform the end result. But it is possible to go from zero to instrument without talking to anyone. Mm. That is true. And just totally order true. stuff in your shop. And, and to me, that is mind-blowing. And, and, you know, the potential is there for any one of you are sitting in your house, wherever on the world you are, to go, I think I'm going to try this. And maybe you have some resources and, and you could get into it. Um, it's possible um, to, to do. I, I don't know why you'd want to be sitting in the chairs that we're sitting in, but because it's not the easiest path. <laughs> But, but look, life is challenging in general. And, and you know, if you're going to have an interesting journey, this is a pretty good one. I will just say, though, um, that, you know, I was wondering, you know, hey, I think maybe I could, I could do this. I could maybe, you know, file, do some sanding, get a hold of a rasp and, and make a carve. On a <laughs> I was, Will, Will, is, Will is smirking right now. Because when I went um, to Spectre to pick up this incredible instrument we did a piece of content where i took a rasp i'm trying to get this in shot wasn't on this base thank god and tried <laughs> to carve a lovely shape at the at the volute i was there in the shop in fact i had multiple people walking me through it and then standing there going oh 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 ah. as i was doing it <laughs> will took the rasp from my hands numerous times and said no 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 more like and i'm like yeah that's what i'm doing and it i i failed horribly at it it was so bad um i mean i feel like that neck just went into the bin you know um and what it did is it gave me an incredible incredible respect and which, which i felt like i had before but getting hands dirty getting sawdust underneath fingernails and doing it good god it's so much work and you have to love it so much. So, um, you know, and not to, you know, this isn't to go against Carrie, what you were just saying, because yeah, of course you can just buy the stuff and give it a go on your own, but man, you got to love it. You got to love it. You got to almost want to do it more than you want to take your next breath. It seems <laughs> very, very difficult. You got, lucky. you got lucky. They didn't put you in the standing and buffing. <laughs> oh, I, of course I, f I feel like will was like this is a task that is potentially doable for you and i failed miserably <laughs> i've sounded and buffed that, a lot of bases that have. being said that though you know <laughs> to briefly summarize a lot of what people have been saying there are so many different avenues you can go down to get into this career you can research tons on youtube you can go to schools you can just do it like with no information ahead of time the biggest thing I would say is just don't be afraid to do it. You probably will fail a couple of times. I've failed on plenty of things, plenty of times. Just do it. Don't be afraid of it. Ah, that's yeah. so cool. That's amazing. Absolutely. Okay. How about this, guys? I've got another question here, upvoted big time from Andy A, which is about net construction. He's asking thoughts on a one piece. So everybody knows what a one piece. Now, this is a beautiful instrument that that uh, Spencer Lull and I collaborated on. This has a one piece neck. Obviously, there's a fingerboard on it, but it's a one piece maple neck. And Andy's asking thoughts on one piece versus three piece or five piece. And here in my other hand, I've got an incredible instrument that Will from Spectre helped, uh, well, that he built, he helped me pick out the woods for, and this is a three piece maple neck. So Andy's asking, is it just an aesthetic thing? or a tone thing or a strength and stability thing question mark one yes. piece, three piece who wants to take this first <laughs> i can say a couple i'll say a couple things and i'm sure we'll all pile on um so again uh everyone is welcome to their own opinion construction style um and philosophy on neck construction there's a lot that goes into that um we prefer uh, one piece necks with, with they're technically two piece necks because they have a fretboard on them, but uh, we prefer that style of construction ourselves. Um, there is a, just a tonal difference, uh, but you also have to, when you're doing that, you have to buy really good wood too. You can't uh, buy cheap inexpensive wood um, that hasn't 
you know, dried well enough and try making a one piece neck out of that. Cause it'll just like, I mean, you're talking, it's not going to do well uh, over the course of the lifetime of the instrument. So I think r- buying really, really good quality lumber is very important. Um, I mean, it goes without saying, especially on a, you know, expensive instrument, but it does uh, change the tone doing that versus, you know, a three piece or a five piece or a lot more pieces uh, to the neck. And just for our style of instruments, again, totally different world than Spectre and totally different world than Zahn, totally different world to, to Carrie's instruments. I mean, it's, that's why I think it's so cool about this panel too, is every one of us, we have totally different, we have similar, you know, aspects of our instruments and totally different aspects of our instruments. And that's, what's also not to sound all like, you know, hallmark moment, but what's so special about the bass world too, is there's, you can find exactly what you want everywhere. The market is so plentiful with awesome stuff. Anyways, I'll end my, you know, speech. You know, Ian's showing those two bases and Carrie, I guess you and I missed out. We, we didn't, uh, send something <laughs> for rotation in the promo video but uh <laughs> i think i think we have one on the way but uh i don't, I don't think i got there in time I know, okay I know. yeah yeah maybe it's on the sh- maybe mine is on the same shipment <laughs> um, <laughs> the guy at customs is, is, is jamming in the back room um you know in addition to wood but what, what what ian is showing us as well is you've got a neck through construction versus a bolt on neck right. construction. And that's a huge factor as well. So, um, you know, obviously, um, the more laminations to, you know, a certain degree, um, will provide a stiffer neck. I mean, uh, Phil Kubicki pioneered that idea with, you know, these, thin laminated th- neck with thin laminations yes god bless you scott and, Devine. Uh, yeah <laughs> there we yeah, go. there's the back of the neck for you and you uh yeah yeah and um he thought that uh he felt that um you know all those laminations provided a, a, a stronger stiffer neck um and i know that you know in, in talking with mike tobias uh he found sonic differences between a neck with a maple neck with one gay stringers and a maple neck with uh, walnut stringers. Um, you know, once again, you start combining these different woods for, for neck material and you're going to inevitably, you know, change the tone of the instrument. Um, but, you know, whether you make a, a, a neck through with, um, you know, seven laminations or a bolt on with seven laminations, you still have a difference between the way the neck is attached to the body and uh, therein you have something that's an, another you know a factor to, con- to consider absolutely will do you have anything to add to this i mean i, I just there was something about going through the shop and checking out the billets and things that you really look for i mean i i think it's fascinating and i'm I'm poking at you because you know so much about this and, and you're, and you're very stoic over there. But I mean, when we were looking at the neck, the three piece neck billets for this instrument, you had some characteristic um, where you were like, well, you kind of want to look for grain that's doing this generally. And I, I was fascinated by like that day remains like one of my favorite days on planet earth. You just need to know that. So, so can you, could you speak a little bit to like yeah. how you guys at Spectre do the three piece billet thing? Well, yeah, ideally. And I think most people do a similar concept, but when you have a three piece neck, what you want to look for is that the two pieces on the outside are opposing grain. Basically, you know, ideally you'll have a piece of wood, cut it right down the center and book matches so that when you glue up that neck, whatever way one side wants to move under string tension when it's flexing, the other side is going to do the opposite so that the neck is more rigid. And that's in essence, the biggest advantage of a three piece neck is that it will in theory, because we're dealing with natural materials that are all different. It will in theory uh, be much more stable long-term. Whereas a one piece neck can be a little bit more prone to twisting, but that's also not, a guarantee because every, like I said, every piece of wood is different. And then you get into the difference of 
quarter sawn, flat sawn, rift sawn, which is just how you cut the wood from the tree and what orientation the grain is to give you the best chance for, well, whatever it is you want out of that instrument, really. Graphite reinforcement, which is also huge mm -hmm. too, you know, yep. very important. Yeah, but I, I, I would venture to say that um, all of you guys, um, you know, based on, on my experience of, of wood neck construction, which is that um, it's just not a matter of finding a, a slab of maple, for example, that is, you know, properly kiln dry. That's one aspect of it. The actual grain structure, how straight the grain is, and... Uh, you know, uh, if it if it's free of any sort of defects is also a, a huge consideration for all of you because you can't just you can't you don't want to you can but you don't want to use something that's well it's dry enough and uh, it's good to go. Um, the the grain is a little squirrely here towards the middle of the neck and it it you know you want to have stuff that's straight and and true and uh, even. That's that, well, that's like that's everything how... else we've been talking about. It's a sum of the parts. You know, there is nothing yeah. we do here that's just a one to one. Everything right. is, you know, there are multiple considerations for every step of everything we do. Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, yeah, for me, yeah, the grain, you want clean grain. If there's yeah. any wobbliness or goofiness, especially at the thinnest part of the neck. Yeah. Uh -uh. <laughs> <Don't believe that. laughs> you want to have the cleanest, straightest grain you can. If it's flat, cool. If it's quarter. I like that right now. I'm into that. It, it works really well. Um, yeah. And and a matter uh, that's one of the advantages of actually doing a three piece piece neck is you can take wood that's this and you can stack it up this way and put yeah. it together. And now you're cutting your neck this way, and now you have effectively quarter sawn grain. So so that's you know one of the advantages of that is so, you can so you're manipulate. Taking flat, you're taking flat sawn and 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 basically flipping it up and turning it into exactly. Right. You yeah, can yeah. you can control the forces within the wood like Will was Absolutely, saying yeah. and try yeah. to try to maximize stability. So if you're not if you don't have that luxury of of I don't want to call it a luxury it's it's a lot of work yeah. <laughs> of putting you know more than one piece of wood together you really got to pay attention to how clean that wood is how long and straight the grain is rifts on is where it's you know it's not coming through the wood directly that is an invitation for something that not only Bend, but bend in a way that you can't address it with a, with a fret dress or something very easily. So, 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 so wood orientation is huge. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that's that's my take on. It. I, I look for the cleanest, best, and and, and tighter grain versus wider grain. Right. Tighter grain, you're going to find heavier, um, and it's going to have a different quality. Um, so, so that's that's what I look for. When I just want to say one thing. Can I say one thing on this whole subject? Um, one thing I want to kind of not necessarily warn, that's the, not the right word, but just urge listeners to do is also when you go and play an instrument and you're looking at instruments, um, don't have a preconceived notion of these different aspects of construction. And don't go and play like, oh, well, that I know that's a three piece neck, so I'm not going to like it based on what I read on the internet about flats on versus quarter sawn versus two piece, one piece. Just go play the instrument and see if you right. like it. And uh, if you don't, and it, if you play something and you happen to love it, and it turns out it's a it's a five piece neck with a wing a fretboard and you know all the different variations, um, then awesome then you love that. Uh, and then don't be afraid to, if you go play, you know, a one piece uh, flats on maple neck, go, oh, I know I'm not going to like that because I like my other five piece neck. Sure, like, right. it's Spencer, okay to like whole, multiple things. Our whole yeah. industry is based on preconceived notions and confirmation Listen, bias. Listen, man. No. <laughs> true. <laughs> no, you yeah. need the It's true though, yeah. Cut. You know, you got you, you almost need to go in there blindfold and have somebody hand you bases and, and, and listen to it. I mean, that's that, that's really your best option. You got to <laughs> trust, trust, you, weird, but trust you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I'm going to assume that. Oh, shit. My camera's gone off, hasn't it? Hang on. Oh, there you go. It's <laughs> there go. So it must have been uh, overheating. Um. I'm, I'm going to see, well, I'll ask this question, then we'll see what happens, right? I've got a base over there. Um, it's probably about $10,000 new. I'm not going to say who, who, who made it. Um, it's beautifully made and 
woodworking's great on it. The B the B string just doesn't work at all. And the and the I didn't buy it from the company. It was actually came into my possession. But the guy the guy he tried different strings. He's done and he's an experienced player. So just let let me let me put it this way. It ain't anything to do with the the strings or the pickups or anything like that. Everything's where it should be. Um and he's tried a bunch of different things to get that that B string to work. And when I play it, even unplugged, you can hear that the, the B string's hollow. Like you hit it and there's just, the resonance isn't there. So I guess the question is, like what could make something like that happen on a bass? Is that to do with neck construction? Is Or is it another one, well, the bass is made up of all of these, you know, a hundred different parts. It could be one of these things, but in your experience, because I'm sure that you've all picked up a bass and thought, Oh, the B string is whack on this. I wonder why, like in your experience, Can I say one thing on that? What's, the, what's the biggest contributing fact to that? Because I know it's not 34 and 35 inch scale because I played 35s with crap B strings, 34s with great B strings, 34s with crap B strings, 35s with great B strings. And I think that, the longer the scale length, I think that, yeah, it can help because obviously you can get now 37 inch scale B strings and it's, and it's great, but they can still be whack on, on the different 34 and 35s. This is a, this is going to sound. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to say a couple things on this, but it might have an apathetic sound to the last thing I'm going to say. Um, you do everything you can to make sure that the setup, the pickup heights, the saddles, there's nothing stopping the resonance of that string um nut you know i mean there's there's so many different aspects that you would check first um fret leveling i mean that's huge 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 on on a uh i mean i can't tell you how many times people have come in like this thing i'm getting dead spots there's all these dead spots all over the neck and you look and like it just it needs fret leveling whether that's a plec or hand fret leveling it just needs fret leveling because there's something stopping the note stopping the string from oscillating properly and actually letting a note ring out. Strings are also very important. Um, having the right string for, for the low B, uh, your playing style, it all comes into, into play there. But um, the thing that's gonna sound apathetic is sometimes a piece of wood or a, an instrument just doesn't want to work that way. Mm -hmm. And it sounds really, really shitty to say that. Excuse my, my uh, French or English, whatever popped out, but um, that just happens sometimes. And again, when that, like, just to be very clear, so it doesn't sound like someone's going to equate that apathetic viewpoint to our instrument manufacturing. When that happens here, I don't sell the instrument. Like there's no, like it's, it's very, very, very rare that I've had an instrument where I go, oh, that uh, actually like literally one out of a thousand. That's about the actual, like where I took it and went, I'm going to do something else to this and I'm, I'll just keep it. And we didn't it. put it yeah. up for sale. Um, and, you know, every builder has gone through that. Every builder has gone through that where they made something and gone, I don't know, that's, you know, and it's, it would be lying if, if, uh, if anyone said, no, 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 no. Like every note on every neck that I've ever made <laughs> and every yeah. string has been perfect. Right. Uh, well but yeah, so I mean, you do everything you can, wood choice, thickness of wood, um, construction style, setup, leveling, pickups, set, I mean, everything to make it so that things resonate properly. And I'm sorry, Scott, if, if uh, you know, the $10,000 base isn't going to be like uh, in the collection for a long time. But um, the, the thing I would say is sometimes it just, you know, maybe the manufacturer should you know if it's a bolt-on neck or something maybe you could get a new neck for it or something if, if you've exhausted all things that's yeah. like the last ditch effort but well, like my suspicion is my suspicion is it is the wood um and and it is a neck through <laughs> oh shit well then oh. just take apart the <laughs> wings you know and no, I'm just <laughs> So, so I think Sorry. what what you what you're talking about is is I mean it's basically a dead spot that you know the bottom note on that that B string is just getting swallowed up by whatever the suspension yeah. and the, the rigidity of that lack of rigidity of that system specifically in relation to that frequency. Yeah. 
Um, and, and sometimes the goofiest things can cause these issues, a loose fret. You play on a loop, you're going up a neck. Ding, 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 oh, why is that one note? Well, and you push on the fret with something, it's all boing, boing, it's bouncing up and down. That's going to soak up all kinds of energy from that string and kill the note. Um, uh, one thing I've run into with uh, the nut on occasion, and, and if there's a gap, let's say the nut's in the slot, and, and it's hanging off the edge where the B string is, and it's not seated or glued in properly, that floating nut can completely yeah. destroy that open B string. Wow. So, so yeah. there's a lot, string angle, um, sometimes you can add a, um, you know, a, a string tree to pull the string angle of, yeah. of the strings across the nut tighter, and that'll change things. Uh, well, you can change the setup, if, the, saddle, the saddle height can change things too. So, and neck bolt tension, Looser tension might be better sometimes and tighter tension. So there's so many factors. So many things. Yeah. Yeah. It, and you know, sometimes, as Spencer said, it's just a done. Yeah. You and it your sucks when that's the case. It sucks. <laughs> yep. Here, yeah. Carrie, you're I mean, I made, with, uh, with, the, with the string nut. Maybe um, there isn't enough of an angle cut in the nut to where the, the string is uh, seated properly. If the mm -hmm. string is laying in the nut without any angle it's just you won't even be able to intonate it as you know so yeah. maybe that's something that's that's not been looked at and needs to be addressed it's is more of an angle cut to the to the slot so that there's a fulcrum point for for that uh, string to sit on yeah i'm gonna go check it out and a lot and some of these things you can't see like it's not like you can just look at it and go oh yeah that's the problem some of them like a nut yeah. angle, how it's laying in the nut. You're not going to be able to find that unless you pull it up and you look and you're like, oh, there's, you know, let's run a file through that. And yeah. you can see a weird like spot on it. Wild. You, yeah. you, can see, you can see a weird spot on the nut in, in, in the slot. So if you in pull the, slot, the string yeah. up and, and you look in the slot, you'll see, a, uh, see it where it, if it's wearing at the front of the slot or the back of the slot. Yeah. By the back of the slot, I mean towards the tuning keys. So um, if you pull that up and take a look, you may be able to see it. Um, and you, you know, you might be able to do something else where um, to get like an impression, like put a piece of uh, tape or even a piece of um, tin foil, string it up and see where it's leaving an impression so that it would tell you, oh, okay, well, that's where the string is sitting. So it needs to be changed or, or not. Yeah, I'm going to check it out. I'll check it out. <laughs> It's why Sorry, I, I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated by B strings and <laughs> on basses and their, uh, yeah. And how good or, or not they are, right? Exactly. They're, yeah, 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 exactly. I, I like selling four string basses now. <laughs> I'm not part of the B string conversation anymore. <laughs> um, hey, guys, how about this one? This is fun. Uh, this uh, upvoted quite a bit. This is from Shekel, who asks... What would the lightest base be made of? What would the lightest base be made of? Balsa wood. <laughs> yeah. Paper machine. Well, you want to talk about you want to talk about dead spots. Um, yeah. Yikes. <laughs> we get into super light woods. I think. Um, gosh, I, that's a that's a really interesting you know, question. But it it does beg the question of what's too light? Where do I, we start to lose tone? Yeah, where where yeah. does it? You know what's the diminishing returns of super light um i'm not a big fan of chambered bodies i prefer to have a, a weight that's at where i want it without having to cut it and make holes in it um i think the tone for me it just delivers better that way and maybe that's part of the, the one piece thing the less glue and stuff that you have the more homogenous it is at the right weight the better it sounds to me but um but yeah the weight is a like i was saying earlier with the, the body the, the woods issue it's a, it's a big deal for tone yeah, we did build an instrument for fun with a balsa wood body, and it was dead as a doornail. It was absolutely <laughs> horrible. Really? Wow. Yeah, it was terrible. It, it was it was terrible. All that being used, said, though, I mean, it's about what you want out of the instrument. And if someone is in a wedding band and you're only playing, you know, four or five hour gigs consistently, and you just need something that's super lightweight. Yeah. Then yeah. yeah, you you know, you go with something that's got a, a balsa wood or a you know Paulonia or a you know Empress, whatever yeah. the yeah the whatever the you know quickest growing tree, plantation growing yeah. tree that you can get your hands on is. 
and then you invest more in your pickups and electronics and your outboard gear and whatever it is, you know, so that you get a sound that you're happy with that still allows you to physically play. And then yeah. for the other yeah. side of the spectrum, someone just wants something that sounds the best regardless of weight. And so it's, it's all a matter of personal preference. Yeah, exactly. And I, I would just also say, yeah, weight is a huge, huge aspect um, we found uh, for, for tone as well. But there is a point where you can go too light. And uh, if you go, at least from what we found, just with building our own instruments, I'm not going to say for every other manufacturer, because somebody might make something that's six pounds and it sounds killer. And I'm like, I don't know how they did that, but sure, that's, that's killer. Um, but yeah, I would say uh, if you're going for light, um, not to go against Carrie's uh, you know, point there, but I, we do prefer chamber bodies ourselves. We find that at least with our construction style, they're a little more resonant. The notes kind of bloom faster out of them, um, faster attack. But that's, again, that's with our construction style. It's what we're doing um, for that lightweight, to achieve a lightweight without having to use a wood that's really, really, really light and then risking the dead as a doorknob uh, balsa wood scenario. Well, you know, you're talking too about, light. What's well, too light? Yeah, guys. I'm exploring that right now. I, I have an NJ5 I'm making, and it's got a, a, a solid curly redwood body that's book matched. And I think the body on this thing has got to be in the two pound range. Um, and then the neck on this thing is going to be spruce, which is also super light. You know, it's the stiffest wood by weight. It's not as stiff as maple by size, that's for sure. So, so I've got, uh, uh, you know, basically two layers of fingerboard. There's a piece of uh, koa and then a piece of pink ivory on top. It's going to be fretless. Um, I probably wouldn't be interested in going super light if it was a fretted instrument, because I think the character that you gain, this is sort of exploring the, the what's too light space, but a fretless space gives you all kinds of opportunity for really interesting tones. Um, and so, so I think this bass will probably end up in the six, six and a quarter range. Um, I've done them wow. before. Um, I did, I did single cut pine body, uh, spruce neck that was glued into it with the pink ivory board that that base is affectionately known as the spruce goose from back in my early days in like 2004 um and in that base it, it messed up the nam show in 2004 when i brought that there a whole bunch of people were like, oh my god you gotta go play that base um, um and it was it was really experimental with all these super light woods but um the guy that owns it loves it dearly and it just has all this character so there's there's a there's a path down the lightweight that brings a lot of character and tonal you know, unknowns, but it's also risky and you might end up with a balsa dud. So yeah, it's interesting what you were saying also, about fretless as well, because the Gary Willis Ibanez signatures are all like super light, maybe like seven and a half pounds or something like that. And they're great. Yeah, they're light they're ash. Deads, but, mm -hmm. Yeah, really yeah, light ash yeah. as well. Can you remember the yeah. um there's of oh, the, this isn't a fretless, the uh, can you remember Steve Swallow's fly base, the oh. prototype. Apparently I just that got to play John Herrera's like like a week ago. A week ago, he has one of those Steve Swallow bases, and I I was like, oh, this is well. He's got the I citron one, hasn't he? He's got the Harvest yeah, Citron one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But before that, that he had a, the Parker. He had a Parker. Yeah. yeah he had a Parker. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Remember with the weird? <laughs> it was like it almost had like this this thing, this knee rest on it as well. It's a really peculiar looking instrument, but apparently that was made out of something like balsa wood as well. And, uh, and that actually sounds killer, but very different from a regular bass, right? It's all, it was piezo bridge, huge action. I think, you know, I'm not sure what strings were on that thing, but it didn't sound Is anything that a Parker like flying. Yeah. 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 That's, they used really lightweight woods and they, wrapped them with the carbon fiber they did yeah they wrapped them yeah, yeah. on the yeah, necks yeah. yeah i think it depends but on the, also... uh, the instrument sorry. style too like um sorry to cut you off um i think like for us we prefer like for a four string if it's like a four string p like a piece like uh, that right blue one yeah. um base is like seven pounds uh, it's like seven and a half pounds it's it's uh it's and it's absolutely fat and awesome sounding like for us we like kind of that seven and a half to eight and a half range for our four strings for the five strings eight to nine so it's like that that's just for us um when we go much heavier like there's that whole camp of of uh individuals that are like the heavier the bass if it's 16 pounds it's gonna sound better uh that's not necessarily always true and also your shoulders will thank you later on in life if you don't 
just gig with a 16 pound bass yeah, for dude. 20 years. Um, but it's the other thing is you can go like we've, we've built instruments before that like we had a really, really uh, insane custom order where the guy wanted it sub seven pounds. And I kept telling the guy, I don't think you're going to like it. Like, I don't want to do it. Like I basically, I don't want to do it. It's going to sound bad. Yeah. And uh, he was like, listen, he was a long-term customer. He was like, if it's bad, I know it's on me. I want to do this. Um, and it was at a particular time when, I mean, just bluntly, we needed the order. I was like, okay, <laughs> I, I kind of need that. Uh, you know, no shame. And we built it. It was six pounds, 12 ounces. So it was like six pounds, six and two thirds pounds or whatever. Um, that base still to this day is one of the thickest bases we've ever made. Like it was unreal how good that base was. And Amazing. the customer's like looking at me like, I told you, bro. I told you. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I, I got it. I'm so sorry. You know? So anyways, it's, there are those exceptions that randomly just are awesome. And yeah, so you can, I, I don't abide by too many generalities. You know, sometimes it's, you have to have some hard bound rules, but yeah. You know, experiment sometimes. Have some yeah, fun. Sure. Just a what real quick say, point. I think it's also important to remember: it's not just wood that plays an impact on weight, and of course, tone too. But you know, you can talk about lighter weight hardware. You can go with lighter tuners, lighter bridge. If you can get away with a fifty-one p and a volume knob, and that's it, that saves you a lot of weight. You know, shorter Oops. scale instruments. There's less wood there. There's less weight. Of yeah. course, all of those things have an impact on. The tone of the instrument for sure but it's it's not just about choosing the lightest possible body wood because then you get into issues and neck dive too and all kinds of things but yeah it's it's kind of like everything we're saying it's it's all of the stuff together it's not just one <laughs> thing yeah, yeah i feel like a broken record <laughs> can they, that can they line be heavy? That, someone's gonna go away from that going okay it's the sum of its parts we get it guys the sum yeah. of its parts yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> can like they be IT, too like, heavy? have you tried turning it off and on again yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could the could the base be too heavy or not? I think so. Subjective. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. Of course Personally. it can for some people and for other people, no. Because there's some really heavy base. Like I've been sort of like you know flirting with the idea of getting a lembic recently because I've never had one and uh and i'm just sort of like super into jimmy johnson at the minute and god bless that guy he just stands up with that bass i think that it must be like 13 pounds or something like that <laughs> and he just he's maybe just more of a man than i am but anyway the bass sounds great so i do i do wonder yeah you know, i guess it depends on what kind of tone that you're after right it, uh, to me jimmy johnson's kind of an anomaly with that olympic and how he uses it in such conventional yeah. situations I, I i find that those instruments are very difficult to to in, integrate into a, a more conventional music situation oh, for right, me yeah. i don't mean any offense to any olympic fans at all i've uh, never but, played but one so i'm out <laughs> it, it, it's it's a it's a crazy thing um um you know, I've got a customer locally that's got some Ibanez or some old school, like Alembic ish copy clone type instruments. Yeah. And he's gone down this road of how close can we make this to that? And and we're trying to help him with that as much as we can. And, um, you know, he's got it to where he swears, ah, this is, this is the thing, you know, and he's, he's got some Alembics. He's, he's got an Alembic also that he's playing around with. And I mean, he's really going after that Jimmy Johnson thing. He'll probably pull it off. This guy's great. But, but, but um, just thinking you're going to get an Alembic and go out there and be Jimmy Johnson is, is, I mean, yeah, I don't know how he does it. Frankly, he's he's amazing. He's yeah, amazing. But, isn't uh, it? Yeah, he's yeah. Amazing. But that's my. I, so yes, heavy instruments. To me, definitely. I mean, I mean, these average six and a half pounds, like six yeah, and a half to seven right, pounds. Right. And so you pick it up, and and immediately when pick it, people pick it up, they go, "Wow, the weight is amazing!" And then they play a couple of notes, and it's this fat, big sound, and they go, "I get to have this light weight with that tone? Holy cow!" So yeah. it works yeah. great, you know. Um, so, so there's a sweet spot to me and uh, somehow I found it with this thing, but, um, yeah, for me, the heavy end of the spectrum is not where it's at. I, I think in general, there is a sweet spot, but you know, yeah. being a custom shop, we see such a wide variety of instruments that, you know, I've played bases with a maple fingerboard, Buckeye top, ash, super light swamp ash back. That is just the lightest bass in the world. And you're like, wow, this is so light. It's super nice. And it sounds awesome. And then you get one that's like, you know, solid walnut, super heavy bass, lots of electronics. And 
sways a lot, but then you plug it in and it sounds awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know, it's it's all I'm not gonna say it again. <laughs> so the there's a lot of there's <laughs> there can be good instruments at in any weight. Absolutely. Yeah. Guys, I've got a I've got a question here for Joe, specifically for Joe. It's the next most upvoted question, and I really want to get to it. Um question oh. for Joe from Patrick T. How daunting was creating the hyper bass for Michael Manring? And how did you approach that crazy request? Oh boy. Okay. So we've got another hour or so, right? Um, <laughs> okay, I'll 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 try to make this short. I'll tell you the story. Um, I first heard Michael when I was on the East coast, um, I was being sent, uh, Wyndham Hill discs of his, uh, his solo records. And I was really impressed by his, uh, compositional work, his, mm. his, uh, material that he was writing. It didn't really, his playing didn't really, it wasn't like the first time I heard, you know, heavy weather. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, when I moved out to, to San Francisco and set up shop, um, I had the opportunity to see him in concert a couple of times and, um, it was astounding. It was really, it was really, an, I mean, uh, I went to go hear his compositions and end up walking out going, man, I'm, my mind has been blown. This guy is just <laughs> phenomenal. Um, but at the time it was interesting because, um, I was sitting in the audience and, um, he's doing a little bit of stand-up in between tunings because he's trying to keep the, the, the audience engaged. So as he's detuning the instrument and so on, he's, you know, telling stories and this kind of thing. And I'm sitting there, you know, kind of antsy in my chair going, thinking all the stuff that he's doing and how I could fix that, I, how I could make changes. And um, so left the show and all that kind of deal. And um, um the person that I knew at Wyndham Hill, I said, you know, you gotta, you gotta let me connect with this guy. I, I gotta talk to this guy because there's some things that I could do to help him. And uh, three months went by and I finally, I finally said, Susie, would you please call Michael and get me? So yeah, I go to see Michael with one of my instruments, fretless uh, four string. And uh, I'm all excited to see the guy. And uh, I go over to his house and, um, you know, he looks at it and he's playing the bass and, you know, didn't seem all that much impressed. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, this is nice and whatever. So I took the bass and walked out the door with my tail between my legs, as they say. And I was disappointed. So um, about three days later, I get a phone call and it's Michael. And uh, he says, hey, you know, um, my music man is down and I, 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 I need to get it fixed. Uh, would you take a look at it for me? And I said, yeah, sure. You know? And so he comes to the shop and I look at it and the electronics were down. It was an old music man. You couldn't get the circuit for it and so on, blah, blah, blah. So I said, you know, it's, the electronics took a dump and um, I got to order the circuit. You know, it's going to take a few days. Said, oh man, I got a gig. I need a bass. I said, well, you know, you can take this one. And he said, Great. So he took the bass that I showed him on this gig. And a week later, I called him up and said, hey, you know, your bass is done. Come pick it up and blah, blah, blah. And he walks to the door and he says, so you want to make me a bass, huh? And I said, yeah. He said, well, you know, I'm a little crazy. I said, bring it on. So um, it was kind of funny because we started talking about things and he said, well, could we do this? And I said, well, first off, let's address this tuning key thing. It's because um, we can, you know, do this hip shot thing where you can preset the tuning and flip it, flip the lever, and you don't have to do the stand up routine, you know, trying to, to tune the bass. And uh, he said, Oh, really? He said, Yeah. I said, So um, would you just do one of them? I said, No, let's do all four. And he's like, Oh, four of them. Okay. So then we went back and forth and uh, we talked about uh, the extended fingerboard and all this kind of deal. And so we just sort of collaborated on this thing back and forth. And it was almost like who was crazier uh, within reason, you know? And so uh, what was neat about it is I built that instrument. In fact, um, I was inspired by an, um, an interview with Frank Zappa one time where Frank said that there were notes behind the fret. 
So um, what I did is I got uh, some um, uh, piano uh, piano piezo uh, 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 pickups from uh, Frischman. And I put a uh, piezo um, under the nut and then I put a few in the body and um, did that trip. And that was a little tr tricky because you had to, you have to have pressure on the piezo to get it to, to work. And so I had to, you know, install it in a very precise manner so that it would work. And um, all sorts of different stuff. Anyway, Michael would come down to the shop and visit every so often as I, you know, he said, well, what's going on? So come on down, check it out. And just in its very early form, you know, Michael was kind of vibing it. He was just, he was able to sort of, you could just feel that there was a, a connection there. And I, I and um, so when we finally strung it up, you know, it wasn't even, we didn't put in the paint or anything. We just sort of, I built the thing and luckily enough, it all came together without any errors. And if there were some, I fixed them, but anyway. Um, and so, you know, he was able to um, start making music with the thing and we strung it up and he said, yeah, this is cool. Let's do this and so on and so forth. So we get the bass finished and um, I knew Jim Roberts. In fact, I, I still know Jim Roberts. We were, we, we were neighbors uh, years ago and I told him about this project and uh, when it was supposed to be done, um, uh, we had uh, an interview at Bass Player Magazine. So um, and this is where it gets to be fun. So Hipshot sent the detuners, but uh, UPS arrived late. We we're supposed to have a, um, a meeting at uh, Bass Player Magazine, Michael and I, to interview and, you know, reveal the instrument and stuff about 10 o'clock. Well, I kept calling Jim and said, well, UPS is late, blah, blah, blah. So we got the detuners. Finally, at noon, we put the things on and we strung it up and um, basically just kind of got it together and uh, hopped in the car to drive down to Cupertino. And so here I am driving to Cupertino and Michael's in the backseat of the car, tweaking out the instrument. And uh, in the 20 minutes it took us to get there, he had already started writing a tune on the thing. Hmm. So uh, we go to Bass Player Magazine and uh, we're sitting in the room with uh, Jim and, and uh, a few other folks on staff, Tom Muller and, and, and uh, Tom Wheeler. And uh, Michael starts demonstrating the bass to these guys. And um, <laughs> it's just incredible. I mean, the guy had never really, I mean, he didn't have any shed time with the thing. And he just started making music with this instrument that we cobbled together you know straight out of the box it was it was crazy and uh what ended up happening is uh, that little office at uh, bass player magazine was was completely jam-packed with the entire staff wow. of uh, of uh, uh guitar player and keyboard player because they had heard what was going on and everybody said you gotta go check this guy out this is wacky and uh that's kind of the quick and dirty on on the hyper bass that's amazing I remember hearing him play that bass and just something I love about your contribution to his artistry is the sound of the levers clicking into place in his compositions, the bridge, like when it, when it drops into different tunings, there's like a mechanical noise, almost like when you hear a, like a sax player, player up close, the keys. Yeah. Like, run this too. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. Well, that's the, that's the thing with that instrument. It, it, the unique, aspect of that bass is that the detuning process is also part of the composition yes so it's more than just a physical manipulation of the instrument it's actually part of the music if, if you can't detune the instrument that way you can't really uh emulate the song you can't you can't copy the tune yeah like an, an enormous room is, is is one of those things yeah Absolutely. if anybody wants to check it out go to youtube and just write in michael mannering enormous room and grab a cup of coffee <laughs> it's bonkers 
he did a session for us last year at Bay Space, and I was so happy. Our producer Nick jumped on, you know, at the at the end of the interview, and said, "You know, Michael, would you would you be willing to just play a little bit?" He said, "Oh, sure," and he just he just blows minds. Yeah. So I mean, I know all of us on this call know that, but if anybody out there, like Scott said, doesn't know Michael Mannering, take a moment and check out that he's just an incredible artist. And then with that incredible instrument that you built, that you had the you know the joe that you just had the willingness to build because there wouldn't be a lot of people that would build that you know you know it but the thing is that it isn't something that um how do i put this i've i've had lots of ideas and things that i wanted to try but i never found anybody crazy enough to do them with me and mm. michael was that guy right <laughs> and, and and so it was it was something that you know, not only that I build for him, but for me as well to explore these ideas, which, you know, I continue to do because, you know, as I, we all find, as we all know on this, this panel, when you're working with different artists and, uh, you know, aside from a sonic thing, there's ideas that they have in their playing technique and, and the way that they approach the instrument that you learn from to create a better instrument. Right. And so, um, you know, that's the, that's the journey I live for. That's the kind of stuff that I love to do is, you know, exploring the unknown. The vintage stuff has been captured and it's it's been done wonderfully. Um, but, you know, I'm uh, I'm in a, in a different direction. Um, I, I respect all that. Um, but, yeah, I want to explore the unknown. Hmm. That's awesome. Um, I, I, I love the spirit of playfulness in the creation of that instrument. It was literally like you guys didn't have any ideas. Michael just was curious. He's above all just curious about exploring what 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 can happen here. And you were like, yeah, let's go. Um, yeah. I mean, that's to me, that's where, you know, the best things happen is, is when you're following this. What is this? Oh, this is really exciting. This is uh, there's something yeah. new here something tr similar but new and it just i mean that's to me that's the sweet spot when we get into that oh you're right so. yeah absolutely guys i think we're gonna have to call it is that right ian i think yeah. we're on well yeah we're gonna have to call it if we just nip around let everybody know where they can find you guys will you do you want to go do you want to go joe first then we'll just go well you guys can't see what i can see but just you take it joe and then we'll go right, around you can find me here in the tropics i'll be sitting at this palm tree <laughs> with a pina colada or two um <laughs> <laughs> you guys are welcome to join me. I'd love to have you. We can carry on the conversation further. Um, no, zongguitars.com. Um, we're in the process of building a new website, and uh, we will let everybody know once that thing is launched, but that's very exciting. But for now, it's zongguitars.com. If you uh, need to reach me personally, it's joezon at zongguitars.com. I'll be happy to answer your questions or uh, you know help in any way I can. Cheers, Joe. And then, uh, yeah, for, for us, it's MikeLull.com. And you can also find us, You could, if you need to reach me personally, Spencer at MikeLull.com. I think we're all going to have very simple emails, which is going to be great for people to, to hear. <laughs> but you can also find us on, we're always on, on Instagram, Mike Lull Custom Guitars, Facebook, and even Threads now, the new, you know, uh, all threads. the new stuff, <laughs> trying to be cool. Yeah. Um, but uh yeah so all all that stuff and that's how you can find us what about you carrie uh well uh the website is nordstrandaudio.com um and then you can find me on on all the meta social medias i guess somehow i got stuck in that so facebook instagram and threads uh just search my name carrie nordstrand on there i post fairly often um and then you know the emails can be found through the website nordstrandaudio.com again so Thank you. Awesome. What about you, Will? Yes, yeah, specterbase.com. There's tons of contact info there. There's tons of information to find there, but also Instagram, obviously, is a huge source for seeing a lot of the stuff going on at the shop. Amazing. Dude, Fantastic. Thank you. It's been absolutely yeah. amazing. I could well, tell you thank you guys. You guys. <laughs> Hold Scott, on. Before Ian, we run. Very much. It's been an honor to be amongst all of you guys, and uh, I wish you all very well. Oh, cheers. Jack. Same Thanks here. Well, yeah, I have to say time. before we go, um, every one of these guys is so passionate and amazing and kind. So support them. I have had amazing experiences with each. I've talked about the shop walkthrough with Will, where I built this dream specter. Um, Spencer, with you, we built this incredible collaboration 
bass together, the hybrid between a jazz and a Thunderbird. Carrie, we spent time together at the NAMM show. Um, a cat bass is on the way. I can't wait to check it out. And Joe, you won't remember this, but I custom ordered a fretless from you in 1998 and you were patient with me. I was 20 years old. You were patient. We were on the phone. You put a Paizo bridge in it at my request. Mm -hmm. You were absolutely amazing. So I just can't thank you all enough for being like the men that you are. You're incredible, incredible men that are so talented. And we're just so happy to have you on this call. Thank you for participating today. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Awesome. Thank Our you. Pleasure. Thank you guys thank you very much. Awesome guys. Take it easy. We'll see you soon. Bye. All right. Take care.